Today at the National Press Club, Melanoma Institute Australia's Professor Richard Scolia and Professor Georgina Long. Professor Scolia has incurable brain cancer and the pair are now using their expertise to try to save his life. Professor Scolia and Professor Long with today's National Press Club address. Welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac address. We're coming to you from the Kerry Packer Education Centre Auditorium on Gadigal land in Sydney. My name is Tim Shaw and I'm a board director of the club. A year ago today at the National Press Club in Canberra, Melanoma Institute Australia Co-Medical Directors, Professors Richard Scolia AO and Georgina Long AO shared their global leadership in the fight against melanoma, Australia's national cancer. Devastatingly, Richard recently received an incurable brain cancer diagnosis. Today's address, Melanoma Science in the Race Against Brain Cancer, using a terminal diagnosis as a path for good. Together in a world first, Richard and Georgina began applying their melanoma expertise to try to save Richard's life and accelerate globally brain cancer research. Early results are in. The world is watching in earnest. You can follow this conversation at Press Club AUST or hashtag NPC. Will you please warmly welcome our speakers today, Professor Georgina Long, AO, and Professor Richard Scullier, AO. Thanks, Tim. We'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting to get today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and acknowledge the deep and continuing connection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to the land, waters and sky. It is a privilege to be here today, addressing the National Press Club 12 months to the day from our inaugural address. Last year, we stood here side by side and put melanoma prevention on the national spotlight. We called for more to be done to promote sun safety amongst children and in sport. And we pleaded with social media and advertisers to stop the glamorization of tanning. The response was instant and impactful. The social media giant TikTok was spurred into action launching an aptly named Tanning That's Cooked campaign, a first for a social media powerhouse. Government and policy makers began working closely with us on several initiatives, including to improve sun safety in sport, which we will be launching with the Australian Institute of Sport later this year. We're also delighted to join the Federal Education Minister, Jason Clare, who's in the audience with us today, along with the Prime Minister and Federal Health Minister at the launch of the Parliamentary Friends of Melanoma at Parliament House earlier this year. Whilst our focus firmly remains on melanoma research, treatment and education, today we have a much broader agenda. It's one pushed to the forefront by devastating personal diagnosis one which has the power to transform how we treat all cancers globally. Today, we will detail world first treatments and scientific breakthroughs in relation to the worst subtype of glioblastoma. It's a type of brain cancer. We are melanoma experts and therefore cancer experts. We have applied the learnings from our pioneering melanoma research into glioblastoma. We have generated in 10 weeks discoveries that would normally take many years. Inspired by progress we've made in recent months, we will today also call on the global cancer field to think big 
and be courageous. Firstly, challenge the paradigm. Look beyond the confines of one cancer, particularly for the subset of cancer patients who are dying on standard treatments. Secondly, design better and cleverer clinical trials and ensure greater access to patients. And lastly, we must embed research into clinical care to generate scientific data faster. This must be the pathway to transform the outcome for cancer patients. And that is what we are here to do today. It's important first that we understand the leading role that melanoma has taken on the world research stage. A little more than 10 years ago, advanced melanoma was an almost certain death sentence within months. The incurable cancer. Australia has the highest rate of melanoma anywhere in the world. And together, we saw the challenge of melanoma in a, as a tremendous opportunity to make a difference to many. Key to shifting the dial has been Melanoma Institute Australia's model of embedding research into clinical care. So this is how it works. Firstly, questions arise in our clinics. Secondly, these questions inform our research priorities which underpin new research programs and clinical trials. And thirdly, we then apply these results back in our clinics to benefit benefit future patients. This is the bedside to bench back to bedside or otherwise known as the translational research model. We take a multidisciplinary approach, all working together towards our goal of zero deaths from melanoma by contributing to groundbreaking clinical and research outcomes. You may all have heard about immunotherapy in cancer. Immunotherapy drugs work by unleashing the body's immune system to specifically fight cancer cells. Immunotherapy has been an absolute transformative revolution in cancer management. But what you may not realise is that immunotherapy was pioneered in melanoma first and other cancers followed, like lung cancer. And Melanoma Institute Australia remains at the forefront of global immunotherapy clinical trials. Now more than 50% of advanced melanoma patients are cured. We are now using immunotherapy for earlier stage melanoma patients, so before the disease has spread around the body. We've begun giving immunotherapy before the initial definitive surgery. This is called neoadjuvant immunotherapy. It's a simple concept. The immune system is better able to see the enemy and be trained against it, and thus mop up any cancer cells that we cannot see. Immunotherapy is like sniffer dogs being trained through exposure to illicit drugs. So when they get to work, they know what they are searching for. And the results have been stunning in melanoma. Recurrence rates have dropped substanti substantially and survival rates escalated even further. And now melanoma science is fueling world first breakthroughs in brain cancer the impetus for which Richard's diagnosis no one would have predicted. I stand here today as a doctor, a pathologist, a researcher and a clinical leader who has dedicated my career to saving lives from melanoma. I also stand here today as a devoted husband to Katie and a proud dad of three amazing teenagers, Emily, Matthew and Lucy, and devastatingly, as of June the 5th this year, I also stand here as a terminal brain cancer patient with grade four IDH wild type glioblastoma, the worst subtype of brain cancer. A brain cancer for which standard treatment and survival rates haven't changed in nearly 20 years. It's essentially incurable. No one survives it and no one saw it coming, least of all me. I was fit, having represented Australia at the World Aquathon Championships in Ibiza in early May, alongside my eldest daughter Emily and Georgina. A few weeks later, I was in Poland doing a presentation. This was one of the rare occasions when I was accompanied by my wife Katie, who's also a doctor. The day after the conference, we went up into the mountains to a beautiful town called Zakopane. We hiked up to some incredible scenery. 
I woke the next morning not feeling quite right. I had a brief phone chat with my mum back in Tasmania. I don't remember much after that. I know now that I had a seizure. An initial CT scan in the local hospital cleared me of a brain bleed. Later that evening, I was taken by ambulance under lights and sirens to a, a larger university hospital in Krakow, 90 minutes away, for further investigations. Katie called Georgina, who is also a close family friend and also the world's top melanoma and immunotherapy expert. Georgina asked Katie to text her a video of my MRI scan. Back in, in Sydney, Georgina sent this to our colleagues, neurosurgeon Associate Professor Brinda Shivalingam and radiologist Dr Ronnie Kapoor. They immediately thought glioblastoma was a strong possibility. This early expert opinion, whilst I was still in hospital in Poland, enabled the Melanoma Institute team, led by Georgina, to mobilise. It was a bleak output, outlook. Standard treatment has remained unchanged for nearly two decades, and for my cancer, survival rates are zero. There were no clinical trials that I was eligible for, and accepting that status quo was never going to be an option. By the time Katie and I arrived back in Sydney, five days after my seizure, Georgina had started developing a novel treatment plan for my brain cancer. It's an interesting phenomenon having a terminal diagnosis as a cancer researcher and a clinician. Knowledge is power, but this makes it difficult to maintain, or does this make it difficult to maintain hope? I've been a pathologist for 30 years. I can interpret my own pathology slides, radiology reports. I understand what they mean. The initial biopsy confirmed that I had the worst of the worst. Grade 4 glioblastoma, IDH wild type, unmethylated, with a wide range of other poor prognostic molecular features. With standard treatment, surgery to remove as much of the tumour as possible without causing deficits, followed by an intense course of daily radiotherapy, then chemotherapy, I had six to nine months at best. My type of brain cancer always comes back. There's no sugar coating it. I knew I was facing a terminal diagnosis. This is tough. I've cried. We've cried as a family. We still do. I just don't want to miss what lies ahead for my kids, my wife, my friends and my colleagues. I'm only 56. I love my life. I've got so much more to do and to contribute. I watched my RPA friend and colleague, Chris O'Brien, go through his own brain cancer battle. The loss of such a brilliant and kind man still stings. Maybe I'm too much of an optimist, but my deep scientific understanding has allowed me to view my own diagnosis through a different lens. Rather than just a devastating challenge, I can see my diagnosis is also a unique opportunity to progress research and treatment for another incurable cancer. So here we are today, four months after my diagnosis, with incredible guidance from Georgina, supported by the Melanoma Institute team and unwavering support from my family, for which I can never thank them enough. We have embarked on a never before trodden path of applying melanoma science to treat my glioblastoma. What we have done is experimental in brain cancer, but it's underpinned by science. I can only do this because I'm a cancer researcher and clinician and so inherently understand the risks. This treatment may extend or shorten my life. It hasn't been a simple path. There was initial resistance from some in the oncology community. Understandable. But Katie and I spent many hours writing long letters detailing what I wanted to do and why. In effect, this was signing away any recourse should my six to, six to nine months become far less. The potential benefits are immense. I may survive. I may, might beat the unbeatable. And in doing so, we will massively impact the whole brain cancer field. At worst, I'll leave a legacy of increased scientific knowledge to benefit future brain cancer patients. 
So what have we done? I've not had the standard treatment protocol for brain cancer and instead stand here today as patient zero in what may become the new frontier of brain cancer treatment. Less than three weeks after my seizure, I became the first cancer, brain cancer patient in the world to have combination neoadjuvant immunotherapy. So before surgery to remove my brain tumour, this was my frontline treatment. Georgina warned me of potential side effects of immunotherapy. I'd had a combination dose, which can be more toxic than single agent. Fortunately, my side effects were manageable. I had some nausea and vomiting, fevers with trouble sleeping, and at times uncontrollable shivers. The surgery to resect my tumour was planned for 12 days later to give the drugs time to work and to activate my immune system against the cancer cells. Early on the morning of the 21st of June, I was wheeled in for neurosurgery with Brinda Shivalingam at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, my workplace of nearly 25 years and where we are today. Brinda has been a colleague of ours at RPA and Melanoma Institute for many years and there's no one I trusted more for my surgery. She was going to remove as much tumour as she could without impairing my brain function. The challenge with my type of brain cancer is that you simply can't cut it all out. Surgeons are limited by the need to maintain function and quality of life. Glioblastoma also has tentacles, like tree roots. It's those tumour cells you can't see spreading silently within your brain that eventually reappear and ultimately prove fatal. To remove my cancer, you'd need to remove a large part of my brain, which is probably not compatible with life. By utilising combination immunotherapy pre-surgery, first-line treatment, we were hoping my immune system would be activated to destroy the cancer cells, which, would undoubtedly, which, had, which had undoubtedly already begun spreading deep into my brain. It was six-hour surgery. I woke not feeling too bad, considering. I could still talk, I recognised my family and colleagues. I vividly, vividly recall Georgina excitedly saying to Brenda at my bedside, you didn't take Richard out of Richard. <laughs> the surgery was a success, although sun tumour was left behind intentionally to maintain my functional capacity and quality of life. Then came the anxious wait for laboratory analysis of my tumour. As a leader of the International Neoadjuvant Melanoma Consortium, I've, I've closely analysed thousands of tumours from melanoma patients who've been treated with neoadjuvant immunotherapy for signs of response. The hope was that my tumour would show similar signs. After recovering from surgery, I returned to work, including at our melanoma tra uh, translational research lab at the University of Sydney here. I'm also back exercising, running and riding my indoor bike. And I'm also proud to announce that only days ago, I had another world first treatment for my brain cancer. I stand here today as the first brain cancer patient to have a personalized cancer vaccine with combination immunotherapy instead of standard treatment. The vaccine is based on my specific tumor DNA and RNA it was administered at the Melanoma Institute in the same clinic where melanoma patients received their personalised vaccines on a clinical trial that Georgina is overseeing. I understand the risks I'm taking. We don't know if these treatments will work. I may do worse. Although this is my personal journey, I'm not alone. A terminal cancer diagnosis is one that many have travelled before. And sadly, many will travel after me. Early on, I decided to publicly document my journey. I've been blown away by the overwhelming response that I've received from people across Australia and around the world. A common question is, why am I doing this? Why be so open and a human guinea pig? It's a no-brainer, I like to quip. <laughs> Faced with certain death, there's no other decision to make. I've spent my life diagnosing and researching cancer, so why would I stop now? In addition to the novel treatments I'm having, I've also chosen to have additional tests and procedures purely for research. This includes a riskier open biopsy, 
delayed resection of my tumour, multiple lumbar punctures, multiple scans and blood tests and various other cognitive tests. Science has a long history of being pushed forward by scientists themselves as subjects. What I'm doing may not be as extreme as the likes of Murray and Pierre Curie who routinely exposed themselves to radiation and suffered the consequences for the rest of their lives. But hopefully the scientific learnings we will generate will be just as profound. Of course I hope my life will be saved. But I'm also proud of the global advances in brain cancer we have already generated. I'm indebted to my friend and colleague Georgina and the wider Melanoma Institute team for their expertise and vision in developing this novel treatment path and for travelling this journey with me. The world is watching and as Georgina will now detail, the scientific discoveries already made are immense. Thanks Richard. Thanks for your strength and your courage and your passion. They're truly inspiring. I've known Richard for uh, more than 25 years and as co-medical directors of Melanoma Institute Australia, we lead a team dedicated to changing the face of melanoma treatments globally. We faced many challenges during that time, but nothing had prepared me for that phone call from Katie from Poland. Richard is my closest colleague and one of my best friends, and his glioblastoma diagnosis devastated me. When I got that call, I felt a physical pain like nothing I've ever experienced before. And it was grief for what Richard and his family were about to go through, and for the thought of losing my dear friend and colleague. The struggle I had at that time was to process that grief and to move forward and to develop a plan as there was absolutely no time to lose. Our collective knowledge is, is immense, it's huge, and Richard's glioblastoma was an opportunity to apply that knowledge to an entirely different cancer. Richard's subtype of glioblastoma is a death sentence and treatment has not changed in nearly 20 years. So given this unique situation, in my view, it would have been morally and ethically inappropriate not to apply our knowledge. I have put thousands of patients on immunotherapy. I have managed their side effects. I have monitored their progress. And I have designed, written, and led multiple immunotherapy clinical trials, including in melanoma that had spread to the brain. I knew that if anything was going to have an impact on the tumour and save Richard, it could be immunotherapy. Those early days after Richard's seizure were spent researching glioblastoma. I spent hours with international glioblastoma experts who generously gave me their time and pharmaceutical companies from small biotech to large corporations. It was also the week leading up to the world's premier annual conference in the US, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I never miss it. I almost cancelled. But then I decided to go and utilise every available moment in trying to understand the drug landscape for glioblastoma. I attended every glioma session I could possibly tend and met with experts from across the globe. I trawled through scientific and medical journals searching for the latest papers and treatment options. It was a barren landscape. You could count the number of immunotherapy clinical trials for glioblastoma almost on one hand. And after all that work, and despite the presence of a small and passionate group of clinician researchers and scientists in the glioma field, there was very little interest in drug development in glioblastoma from the pharmaceutical industry, particularly for Richard subtype. In an absolute travesty, there was not one single clinical trial available for Richard. That is, upfront, first line, not one. And by extension, that meant not one single clinical trial for other patients like him. Perhaps we were naive in our expectation. In melanoma, 
every patient, particularly those with the most difficult to treat subtypes of melanoma, are considered for clinical trials. And we have many trials open at any one time. It seems so unjust for Richard, whose expertise has been critical in some of the most innovative and clever clinical trials in melanoma, to not have access to a clinical trial himself. All that was on offer was the standard treatment which had not changed in nearly 20 years since the early 2000s. I was astounded, disappointed, but above all frustrated. As scientists and researchers, it is incumbent upon us to push the medical field forward. Melanoma had broken new ground and many thousands of lives saved as a result. Could any of these learnings be applied to the most difficult to treat cancers such as glioblastoma. Our colleague, Professor Helen Rizos, who is here today, an incredible scientist and chair of the Melanoma Institute's research committee, shared my vision that we had an opportunity. Actually, we had an obligation to try something groundbreaking. We wanted to try to save Richard, or at least extend his life. But we also wanted to push the field forward. Helen and I gathered the Melanoma Institute's translational research teams and we began strategizing along with the neuropathology team and others from around Australia. We are not brain cancer specialists. This was, not a, this was a new field for us. But we know how melanoma works, we know how cancer works, and we know how immunotherapy works. There was pushback. There were no clinical trials, no protocols for using immunotherapy in this way, in this type of brain cancer. This cancer is in the most precious and critical organ, the brain. And that organ is in a closed box, the skull. So any swelling could be exacerbated by immunotherapy with dire consequences. And with that came a lot of fear because you cannot live without a brain. But the upside of immunotherapy is that it may deal with this problem by stimulating immune cells to selectively kill cancer cells and preserve normal brain cells. It's just like those sniffer dogs at the airport darting around the luggage searching for illicit substances and ignoring everything and everybody else. Brain swelling was really only a relative risk and likely low from our own experience in melanoma that had spread to the brain. Other barriers were put forward, and these included that brain cancer is immunosuppressive, so it would not respond to immunotherapy, and that brain cancer is heterogeneous, meaning full of different cancer cells, so impossible to target all of them effectively. But these were not barriers for us. We had navigated all of these supposed barriers in melanoma itself, including using immunotherapy to treat tumours which had spread to the brain. We were comfortable as cancer researchers to not have fear. Combination immunotherapy in a true neoadjuvant setting has never been used in brain cancer. By this we mean frontline, first up, before surgery, before radiotherapy, before chemotherapy. In melanoma, we have proven that immunotherapy is much more effective when it's given before definitive surgery so that the immune system is more activated to fight the cancer. There have only been a very small number of international clinical trials using immunotherapy in brain cancer, but none using combination therapy, immunotherapy, as frontline treatment. So Richard's treatment, combination neoadjuvant immunotherapy up front, first line before surgery, has broken new ground. Yes, Richard is a patient of only one, but early scientific results are nothing short of phenomenal. And I'm delighted to share these with you now. Laboratory tests on Richard's tumor removed 12 days after he received combination neoadjuvant immunotherapy showed, firstly, there was a tenfold increase in the immune cells within the tumor. Secondly, these immune cells were activated against an enemy. And thirdly, the immune cells within the tumor were bound to drug, proving something we had already shown in melanoma, 
that there is no blood-brain barrier as historically conceptualized, preventing the drugs from reaching the tumor. We could not have hoped for better results. The neoadjuvant combination immunotherapy was doing what we had seen it do in melanoma, but this time it was doing it in Richard's brain cancer. As Richard also revealed, he is the first person in the world to have a personalized brain cancer vaccine with combination checkpoint inhibitors instead of standard treatment. Melanoma Institute and the melanoma field has led the world in the development of personalized cancer vaccines. So using that expertise, we took Richard's tumor, analyzed the whole genome of his tumor and of him to identify what is unique in Richard's tumor that has a high potential for the immune system to recognize as an enemy. Using this scientific data, a personalized vaccine was developed to further boost the immune reaction against his cancer cells. We are now looking at laboratory data to determine the effectiveness of the vaccine. But we have a backup plan. We were able to isolate so many activated immune cells from Richard's tumor after the neoadjuvant immunotherapy that we have a substantial supply of Richard's immune cells to infuse into him should the need arise. We are looking forward to publishing our data in a high impact peer reviewed journal and presenting at a scientific conference in a few weeks. Whilst this early scientific evidence is promising, it is too early to tell if this will translate into clinical benefit for Richard. Only follow up scans as the weeks and months go by will determine that. Importantly, the global glioblastoma field is already taking action as they see our data. Based purely on our scientific findings, some forward-thinking biopharmaceutical companies are investigating starting programs for glioblastoma, including support of truly neoadjuvant clinical trials. Such trials are how new treatments are tested in a clinical context and, if effective, saves lives. As a scientist, it is ingrained in me to treat these results with caution. But as Richard's long-term close friend and colleague, for the first time since Katie's call from Poland, I feel some optimism. <coughs> Turning now to what needs to be done. We know we're not curing as many cancers as we could. Today, we call on the cancer research field to collectively re rethink its approach to tackling cancer. Think big and be courageous. As we mentioned at the start, there are three important messages. Firstly, challenge this paradigm. Our brain cancer advances based on one single patient and one single tumour are the tip of the iceberg of what can be achieved when cancer researchers and clinicians underpinned by science, are brave and prepared to challenge the status quo. Secondly, clinical trial participation needs to be bolstered. It's key to developing life-saving treatments and pushing cancer research forward. In Australia last year, less than 6% of cancer patients were on a clinical trial, leaving the remaining 94% reliant on standard treatment or the status quo. That's a bleak outlook for patients with the most difficult to treat cancers, like Richard's, which is incurable. To bolster participation in clinical trials, the clinical trial design for drug therapies needs to integrate scientific knowledge generated across all cancers and be performed in the right patient population. For example, immunotherapies after radiotherapy and after chemotherapy and in patients who are receiving immune suppressing drugs for brain swelling are unlikely to be effective. That's why Richard received immunotherapy upfront first line. Also, pharmaceutical companies need to invest and open clever clinical trials that include all cancers 
even rare cancers. Glioblastoma gets knocked back for drug trials because it's a small market with such a poor prognosis. And for Richard's tumour, standard treatment has not changed in nearly 20 years. Drug companies should consider the 50,000 people dying from cancer in Australia, not just, for example, the 1,300 dying from glioblastoma. Then they can generate monumental change. Doing research into these difficult to treat and rare cancers is similar to the Matilda's recipe for success. Any player on the field or coming off the bench can kick the winning goal. Just like research into any cancer, rare or common, can transform the field globally. And now our third and final message. We must embed research into clinical care to generate scientific data faster. This provides insights into the biology of cancer and is critical to informing clinical trial development for drug therapies. What we're advocating here today is to embed research into clinical care. It's a philosophy. Use the observations in clinic to generate the research questions. Address these questions in the laboratory and via clinical trials. And thirdly, then feed those results back into the clinic to impact future patient outcomes. And the cycle continues. This is translational research at its best and is most impactful bedside to bench and back to bedside. In summary, overhauling the global research, cancer research paradigm is long overdue. Cancer patients are dying every minute of every day across the world. There is so much we should and can be doing collectively, and if not now, then when? There is hope. And there is progress. Look at what we at Melanoma Institute have achieved in a short period of time, working with one single tumour, Richards. Collectively, the global cancer community needs to be brave and it needs to be bold. We hope for nothing more than both of us being able to stand here again this time next year as proof that the breakthroughs we've outlined today and our calls for change have saved lives. Finally, I'd like to end by publicly thanking you, Georgina, and also to say special thanks to Katie and my wonderful family, and say thank you to all, the, all of you for the incredible support that I'm receiving. Thank, thank you. you. I think the audience here is representative of many, not only watching at home, but right around the world. Today you've announced here at the National Press Club a remarkable Australian story. Richard, you've received this first vaccine. May I go to you first? And if you can, just share with us, after this first vaccine, some tests, when would the next vaccine, how many vaccines do you and Georgina feel will be required? Well, thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to have the first vaccine, which I'm actually having the second dose tomorrow. So it was two weeks ago um, tomorrow that when I had the first vaccination, um, it, it wasn't too bad. It's quite a big volume, so my arm was pretty sore for a few days afterwards, but it didn't knock me about systemically. The plan is to have um, them every two weeks for a certain period. Georgina is better placed than me to, tell, to say exactly what that is. And then it, after, I think it's about three months, it gets extended out and continues for 12 months if things go well. Georgina, that breakthrough moment when you could see those immune cells and their reaction and breaking down that blood-brain barrier narrative as a researcher, as a scientist, as a medical doctor, treating a friend, but a patient, what went through your mind? I was ecstatic. We were not expecting that. Um, many of the translational team are here today and the, the feeling of um, just joy and delight and, you know, uh, surprise, actually. We, we truly 
were not expecting such a good result. I can talk for the whole group, the whole translational group, we were not expecting that. We thought we might see something small, 12 days. In melanoma, we usually wait six weeks. Uh, we know in melanoma you can see changes at even sort of three to five days when we biopsy melanoma early on. Um, but we weren't expecting this in glioblastoma. Clinical trials is an issue that you've brought up. And I want to go to our questions from our journalists. But this news of this world first brain cancer, personal brain cancer vaccine administered to ground zero, the patient. How does that make you feel, Richard? Well, I'm, I'm thrilled, delighted. Um, I guess the cancer vaccines have been tried for some time and in the past they actually weren't, weren't that good. Um, and they actually made some patients tolerate their tumour. Their immune system got cut off, from, blocked off from fighting it. But in recent years, through pioneering work that started in melanoma and now used in other cancers, that field's changed. In fact, what happened was with the mRNA vac vaccinations that we all know about from COVID, they were, before COVID happened, they were being trialled and utilised, developed in cancer, in melanoma. And then COVID hit. And so there was a pivot to develop them very quickly to try and help the, the world cope with this pandemic. And, and now we've moved through that and focusing again on cancer. It's fantastic to welcome Sydney journalists here to the National Press Club of Australia. And our first question is from Gary Maddox from the Sydney Morning Herald. Thanks very much. Firstly, I should thank Georgina and Richard because I'm a benefit of their expertise. I was diagnosed with stage four melanoma four years ago. And as a result of uh, immunotherapy, I was effectively cured. So I'm testament to your brilliance and I hope this works again. <laughs> Can I ask about the idea of a cancer vaccine? Is it something that there'll come a time when vaccines personalised vaccines can be given for all forms of cancer, do you think? Um, so the first thing to break down is vaccines as we know them for measles, for infections, for COVID, which is either to prevent the disease altogether or to prevent a severe illness from the infection. When we're talking about, and then we've got cervical cancer vaccine, which is again to prevent the cancer completely. That is one type of very important vaccination. What we're talking about today is different. These are vaccines to boost the immune system against a tumour you already have on board. Um, I would hope that as research continues and clinical trials are done, that yes, eventually, and we have to test it out, that eventually we may have more widespread use of personalised vaccines uh, in cancer. There are different technologies that can be utilised. We're still at that early time I and mean, we've been using those sorts of cancer vaccines in melanoma for several decades without effect and it's really only recently that we're starting to see an impact in melanoma outcomes. Um, I would hope that we can stretch or uh, cover other cancers and look at that. In fact, recently there was uh, some published data in a small number of pancreatic cancer patients. Very small, but a really clever clinical trial. I think it was only 15 patients or so. And the cleverness is ensuring that you collect tissue and other evidence of immune activation that is matched to the tumour and the, vacci the vaccination itself. And so that's what we're doing right now. We've got some very novel experiments we're looking at with Richard to try and see if we're getting specific immune cells against the vaccine we have created. Um, but I, I think there's a long way to go, but the only way to get there quickly is clever clinical trials. And it has to be done in a clinical trial so we get the right data. Tim, if there's one more thing I could add, I guess it's by, by the by, but the three of us actually represented Australia at the World Triathlon Championships in Lausanne um, five or six years ago. That's right. And uh, happily I'll get to um, uh, represent again. I hope to be with you, Richard, at some yeah. stage. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from Jason Gale from Bloomberg. Thank you for flying up from Melbourne. <laughs> Melanoma was a very tough nut to crack. How does this challenge, how does glioblastoma compare? 
do you want to go? I'm well, happy to go. Well, it's definitely a, a tough nut to crack. And I guess that the real challenge about brain cancer is there's no tissue to spare. We need all of our brain if we want to function the best. So that's one challenge. So unlike a tumour that occurs on your arm or somewhere, that there's spare tissue. So you can easily cut it out without causing devastating effects. So that's one pro problem. And, and another problem is that it's inside your skull, a hard box that you can't access very easily. And also the effects of therapy can cause swelling on your brain and it's in a box. So if you get swelling in your brain, there's only one tube out of it. It's where your spinal cord comes out and that can push the part of your brain called the brainstem, which maintains basic functions that keep you alive. If that gets pushed down into your spinal cord, it's often over, all over Red Rover. So they're the challenges. For the type of brain cancer that I've got, one, a big challenge is some tumours can be well circumscribed, but for the type of glioblastoma I've got, it's got this peripheral infiltrative pattern of growth. That means it's very hard to, to remove it all. There's little bits that sneak off everywhere. So we need to develop therapies that will select out the tumour cells and leave your normal brain alone. And that's why immunotherapy is so appealing because it can teach your immune system to recognise the tumour cells and hopefully leave your, your, your um, normal cells alone. I guess we don't know the answer to that yet, but the results that Georgina outlined are certainly encouraging and yeah, all fingers and toes crossed at my end. I was gonna, just to, to in a nutshell, it is tougher. I think for the reasons Richard outlined, it's the organ it sits within. A lot of other barriers are put forward within the cancer field. Um, but we've had those barriers in melanoma. All tumours, solid tumours are heterogeneous by definition. They have to be. That's what a tumour is, a cancer. Um, so the biggest barrier in our view, because uh, we've discussed this a lot, is the organ in which it sits and the skull in which the organ sits. And so therefore there's a lot of pressure to get the tumour out early because of symptoms. And so that can be the tricky bit. But that, that, I think that's the two things that really makes this the hardest nut to, to crack, the, the organ in which it sits. And one other thing is these tentacles, you can't even see them on a scan. And um, Brinda, I think, is in the audience, will tell you, you can't even see where it ends in the operation. It's really a really ugly tumour. Will that vaccine find those tree roots? Will that vaccine be able to see that clear liquid that it, Brenda, in the post-operative process? Is that the objective? Absolutely. So the objective of the vaccine is to stimulate the immune cells, your immune system, to be able to recognise the tumour cells and select those out, leaving your normal brain alive. We don't know if it's going to work, but that's the aim. Our next question comes from Ali Langdon, the host of A Current Affair on the Nine Network. Hi guys, um, this is such amazing research in such a short period of time, but Richard, you are one patient and it's one tumour. There are a lot of patients and families watching this very, very closely. What are the next steps and when might this possibly be available to them? Well. I can pitch in, but Georgina might want to add to this. I think ultimately to change clinical practice, you need to perform clinical trials and show that a, any therapy improves it. What we've done is experimental on me. We've generated some data to suggest there's hope in giving immunotherapy at an early stage in treatment. But for, for, we need to prove it works in a bigger population of cells. We don't even know if it works in me. We've got some great scientific data but it won't be until sometime down the track with uh, further scans and other things that, ha that happen with me, whether we know it's actually making a big clinical difference. Um, I think the important thing, two, two things. First of all, I don't think this could be done in anybody else. It's a unique situation of someone who completely understands the risks. I think um, even one of my family members probably uh, would not be able to go through with such a, a treatment with no data. It just is not something that the that or, or people who are not in cancer research knee deep, like Richard, could tolerate that risk. Um, 
The, the second thing is we've got to have clinical trials. That is the right framework. This is N of one. We don't know that, well, let's say you took 100 glioblastomas like Richard's, IDH wild type, because there are treatments for IDH mutant, but IDH wild type, unmethylated, uh, poor prognosis. If we took 100, we are yet to know what percentage can we activate the immune system early on like this. It may be 25%, it may be 50%, it may be lower than that, we don't know. But what we had come into this with is that but it's going to be nothing. No one's going to respond. And we've got one, so now we need to see really what are the stakes here. The problem with the glioma in the brain cancer field is that because it's in the brain, standard treatment is usually done, and then clinical trials are done after the standard treatment. And that is not the best to, for things like immune therapy. It might be okay for some targeted drugs or chemotherapy. Even then, the patients are often not well. Um, but for this type of treatment, uh, it's something that needs to be done early on. I can tell you, a melanoma patient, if I gave them chemo and radio and waited six months, uh, their chances of responding to immunotherapy, and we're curing so many, uh, wouldn't be very high. We need to remember that 95 out of 100 melanoma patients died. It's down to 50. With advanced melanoma that is spread right. around the body, yeah. It, you, you said in your speech that it would be morally and ethically uh, inappropriate not to use our knowledge in this cause. But Katie and you had to write some very long letters explaining to people why you needed to go down this course. The Federal Minister for Education is here in our audience today. His colleague, the Federal Health Minister, these are ministers that want to hear what the future is. What's your message to those that may be reluctant to shift the paradigm and to think in a new way? To, to be honest, I, I don't... I don't think it was unreasonable that we needed to write those letters. I can't thank Katie enough for all the hard work that, that she put in to, to help me put this together. Because ultimately the evidence for treatment needs to come from, ultimately from clinical trials that are developed. So when a patient wants to deviate from standard therapy, then it's, it's risky for the clinician, uh, the treating clinician to do that. So they needed some some support. There was, there was certainly um, resistance at first and it took uh, at length discussions with them to get people on board and, and knowing the field so well, the data that we've produced in melanoma really fed me with passion that made sense to me when there was, when there was certain death in front of me, why not give it a go and see if we can change things not just for me but for the field. I remember talking to a colleague Michael Boyer, who's a medical oncologist, and, um, and he said to me, yeah, it's a no-brainer for a tumour like yours because it, there's not, nothing we can do to cure you. You're, you're facing death. It's worth giving it a go. So, yeah, I was impressed with, with his support and gradually others became on board and, and supported this treatment path and they continue to do so. Not just G G Georgina, she's the one who was pushing us and, and really supporting in a big way, but a wider team of people now are are looking after me. Uh, one important thing is infrastructure, uh, infrastructure for clinical trials. Um, the clinician researcher, uh, which both Richard and I are, we're funded purely by grants. I don't have a permanent position, for example. Not that I need one, because there's always problems to solve, but infrastructure and making research a little easier would be great. The one thing I think we had at Melanoma Institute is um, a lot of passion, that's for sure. That's an important ingredient. You can't be forced together. And we had a very, very singular goal with melanoma, you know, uh, zero deaths from melanoma. But also having uh, Richard's glioblastoma as our single goal really brought us together. Uh, but we've utilised all our own infrastructure uh, it's been um, just piggybacking, piggybacking on all the stuff we all normally do for melanoma. Mm. So infrastructure support and clinician researchers and working with scientists more closely, having some of those barriers, because I can tell you there's no way this would have happened without that scientific team working clinically with us to make this happen. 
So I think looking at those models and supporting that would go a long way. Tim, could I just add one thing before we go to Gabby? That the um, <coughs> something I'm really proud about of what we do at the Melanoma Institute. We've got a really dedicated cross-disciplinary team of people who are all focused on, on the problem of melanoma and how we can cure it. And we wouldn't have had such success if it didn't start from one end and finish at the other end. So everyone's making sacrifices from the clerical, secretarial yeah. staff to enrol patients on clinical trials to, to uh, um, uh, uh, pa patients uh, generously allowing to, uh, us to collect data about them, donating their tissues and other specimens so we can perform this research, to, to be honest. And philanthropy. Yeah. And philanthropy. Well, we're not funded by the government at the Melanoma Institute. We're reliant on philanthropic money to and keep us very surviving. supportive donors and philanthropists in the room today, melanoma survivors, and we also have brain cancer mm. survivors. Our next question comes from Gabriella Rogers from Nine News. Georgina and Richard, thank you so much for your address today. Richard, how do you feel about the latest results? How encouraged are you with what Georgina spoke about earlier on? I'm, I'm blown away as, as, a, as a doctor, as a pathologist. I've, I've looked at so many patient samples of people who have been treated with neoadjuvant immunotherapy. I know the different changes that you can see. And, to be honest, I wasn't expecting to see so much at, at 12 days after immunotherapy. In melanoma, we usually wait for, for, three, uh, for six weeks before removing the, the tumour and, and then assessing it. And um, Brenda, who's in the audience, the neurosurgeon who took out my tumour, we had some negotiations. We, she said, look, we can't wait six weeks. There's a risk that your brain tumour will just take off and I'll never be able to chop it out and you'll die very quickly. So we came to this arrangement where we'd wait 16 days between the two procedures and 12 days after immunotherapy. For brain cancer, it doesn't start off with much inflammation that you can see within the tumour. So the ch and what from do you mean by inflammation? It's immune cells. Immune you don't cells. see immune cells yeah, in the tumour. And we know in melanoma, if you start off with more immune cells, there's a better chance that there'll be more of them and they, they change their phenotype or types as we, mo we move along. So at 12 days, I, I, I didn't think in brain cancer we'd see this. I, I'm shocked, blown away. It's left me with optimism. We don't know that if it'll translate into improvement in my clinical care, but yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled about it. it yeah. It, it, couldn't have been better, really. And does this confirm to you that you've travelled down the right path in trusting Georgina, that you decided not to go the standard path and the protocols? This has encouraged you more that you've done the right thing? Well, I think whether it makes a difference to my clinical outcome, who knows? But I'm very proud of the fact that we've now contributed to the science in brain cancer, which I know is already changing the field. Um, Georgina might tell me off if I'm not allowed to go public with this, but I know some of the data has been shared with some biopharmaceutical companies and, and they're blown away. They can't believe that this is happening and they're interested in, in investigating more opportunities in, in potential clinical trials and, and drug therapies in, in glioblastoma. So yeah, I hope I haven't overstepped the mark, Georgina, but it's, um, yeah, it's exciting. Blood biopsies, liquid biopsies. I know that your spinal fluid, you've been doing a lot of lumbar punctures. How important is that in the future of um, brain cancer diagnostics and managing it further on? Do you think that that's important? It's a great question. For some cancers, like in melanoma, we know it's a, um, a liquid blood. biopsy in blood is, is a great way to track your response, particularly if it started to spread. But in brain cancer, we, we're not so clear. To be honest, the re, one, of the, one of the molecular abnormalities within my tumour is a particular gene we know really well in melanoma. And you we mean did tert promoter, tert promoter mutation. mutation. Yeah. And we saw a little bit of it at the start in my cerebrospinal fluid, but unfortunately it's not there. And we thought this might be a great tool because the radiology can be hard to under, separate out recurrent tumour from the effects of treatment on your brain. So we thought this might be a good tool to separate it out, but so far it's not looking so positive to panning out. So yeah, we collected Richard's blood 
Um, Helen Rizos actually uh, leads liquid biopsies in cancer in general, um, blood and the CSF, the spinal fluid. And there was one droplet of TERT promoter in the blood, but there's been nothing in anything else. And you can't rely on one droplet. That's not a reliable test, so we don't think it's real. So we don't know, but it might work in others. Our next question is Megan Brody from MedNews. Hi, and um, thank you, Richard, for being a human guinea pig. I think Australia needs a lot of human guinea pigs, unfortunately, to test these things. But uh, looking at the economics of it, I did a little bit of a back of the envelope uh, calculation of your neoadjuvant combination therapy, vaccine plus IO, and it looks like you've got a cell therapy in reserve. If we extend or save your life, you're going to be looking at close to $2 million, probably, for the cost of your treatment. When we look at clinical trials, it's fantastic. They are free, effectively, to put people on. The companies pay for them, but there has to be funding at the end of that. Right now, for one IO on the PBS to give you one year of life, that's about $50,000 is what we would pay for that. So, uh, And we only ever look at a 20-year timeline discounted by 5% a year. So it's quite a, a calculation as to what a life is worth. At the end of the day, uh, even if all of this is effective, we have to ask ourselves, what is a life worth? And what is Australia prepared to pay for that life? Because as Georgina's pointed out, the earlier in the treatment cycle that you can actually have those treatments, the more effective they are. But we're looking at cell therapies which are fifth line or fourth line, and they're cures, they're curing people. How do we actually get a change in the conversation in Australia so that we can start thinking about what a life is worth and what Australians want to pay on the PBS to keep someone alive? These are important questions and I, I accept what you're saying. I just wanted to give one example. Um, we know in melanoma, neoadjuvant immunotherapy is more effective than giving it, so that's before surgery, is more effective than giving it after surgery. Recently, that's in early stage melanoma. So we're talking early yeah, stage. Yeah, stage, stage three, three melanoma. So when it's spread to local lymph nodes. And Georgina and I recently um, put a submission to our pharmaceutical um, benefits scheme at PBAC. And based on evidence that, w that we'd produced and others had produced showing that it was more effective. It was already approved and paid for in Australia as an adjuvant therapy. Mm -hmm. But by giving it neoadjuvantly, better outcomes for patients and for a subgroup of patients, they don't need to continue it on anymore. It's saving the government money ultimately. And as I understand it, this is the first time in our country that, uh, uh, that investigators, so not pharmaceutical companies, have put forward a submission to the PBAC and it's been approved. So that's something I think we can both be very proud of. And yeah, ultimately, I think that's yeah, re really important. I think, I think your question about cost, how much we're willing to pay, is very important. We all pay taxes and that's how our lovely health system is funded. And there's not an unlimited budget. Everybody knows that. However, as you innovate, it gets cheaper. And as you innovate the treatment and how you give it, you may be giving less. So for example, in the neoadjuvant in melanoma, when we use dual immune treatment, two doses, 75% of patients have a great response. They don't need any more treatment. So just in us doing investigator-led trials of immunotherapy before surgery, we've seen that two immune drugs together, 75% of patients respond and they don't need any treatment. We've already cut the budget by uh, maybe 80%. So innovation is important because innovation ends up in time to be cheaper. So personalised vaccines, I'll give you an example. In 2019, <coughs> when we were doing this before COVID, um, it would take six weeks to generate an, an mRNA personalised vaccine. Now it takes three weeks. Um, so that is saving in and, in and of itself. The whole genome, to do the whole genome in 2000 and to do it now, it's a piece of cake. So I guess what I would say is we've got to invest in the concepts and the innovation because that investment pays off big time and it's already paid off big time in melanoma. Thank you. And our last very short question comes from Morris Riley, the CEO. What, in, what interest are we seeing from... Uh, uh, 
big pharmaceutical companies around the world in this? <laughs> or are you hoping this address will, will spur on some interest? I hope this address will spur on more. Did you want to make a comment? No, no. no. So, um, <laughs> I hope this address spurs on more interest. Um, some have been inc oh, the innovative ones, the ones with imagination, the creative ones, and often have a track record in being creative, are gobbling this up and wanting to know what else they can do. Um, and so that's really pleasing. Some really large, lacking innovation, not, not the creators, uh, just will not invest in glioblastoma. They won't, for the reasons I outlined. But that's not where innovation happens. Innovation happens when you've got the little creative groups or the, even the medium-sized groups that are innovative, creative, want to do something different. And um, so we've had some interest from those sort of biopharmaceutical companies, which is fantastic, um, and we can't thank them enough. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please thank Professor Georgina Long AO and Professor Richard.